Welcome to the New Overlords podcast, where we talk about video games, video game news, and what's fun. I'm Max, and with me is someone who we dig just as much about as she digs the ground in Azeroth, my co-host Sima. <laughs> wow, you must like a... me a lot, because <laughs> I've been digging too much. You have Wait. been digging, haven't you? Yes. Can yes. you dig it? And Seema says, apparently, yes. <laughs> yeah. But more about that later. Yes, we will be talking about that quite a bit today. I know that's that's very compelling content right there. I think uh, this is mostly going to be an episode where we go through a little bit of news and then just kind of catch up on all the things that we've actually been playing for the majority of our time. And we we feature something new that we play quite often, but... We then run out of time to talk about what else we've been playing, so we're going to catch up on what else we've been playing. But we have some big, big news uh, to to talk about too. Some some good news and some other uh, hellish news. So let's get into that. Good news, everyone. First up in the news, let's get right into it. The drama this week around hell divers. Hell divers, hell divers. So over the course of the past week or so, week and a half, no, I guess it's all been in the past week, really. Uh, if you haven't heard, there was a whole big uh, debacle going on with hell divers. So hell divers, no, and gadget, I don't want to take your survey. Thank you. Uh, hell divers has been out for a couple months. So hell divers was published by Sony, and it was an independent studio that made it called Arrowhead. So this is an Arrowhead game. They're an indie game. Indie game studios is they're they're you know they're, they're putting it out there. They did a really good job. They did some interesting stuff. So Sony wanted a hold of this game, and they're going to help them out. And they're going to do the publishing. So Sony's just in it for a publishing relationship. And what Sony said was internally, their business plan is all right. This cross-platform thing, PCs and console. This it looks like something we'll finally get around. You know. 15 years later than we should have. Maybe we'll, we'll do a little bit more of this. Here's an opportunity. Let's do it with Helldivers. This little this indie game, let's get it out there. Okay. Uh, Helldivers is getting ready to publish. It comes out in February, early February. And their indie game, their networking doesn't work all that well. What PlayStation Network and what Sony wanted from the onset was... Okay, if we're going to do this cross-platform thing, we want it on our backbone. We want a PlayStation account for everyone. Just like when you play all the Bethesda games, you actually log into a Bethesda account, account whether you're playing on Xbox or you're playing on Steam. I mean, and Star Wars Republic Republic is that way. You can play it on Steam, but you're still logging into their launcher. Right. And you could see, you could see that, I mean, that makes sense from a, an overarching perspective. However, the game wasn't really ready for it, so it got pushed out there ahead of time, and they said, okay, well, fine. We're, we won't do the Steam, the PSN account integration at launch. Okay. Everything's still, everything's fine. Uh, game gets super popular, un- incredibly popular over m- months. And now it's been going on for months. It's, it's been incredibly popular. And then things start to get confusing. Uh, so around the 1st of May, 2nd of May, Sony announces, hey, we're bringing that back in. Now it's time. We're going to require PSN. Couple problems there. So this is bad behavior all around. They didn't really make that explicit from the very beginning. It was their plan, but they didn't really make it apparent to everyone for, for one. For two, the game has been selling, and this is where it gets confusing, but because now I've seen like corrections to articles that I the what people were thinking was is Sony just let loose on Steam and Arrowhead and Sony just let it loose on Steam and you know everybody around the world bought the game and played the game. And the problem is when you say now it requires a PSN account, PSN is only in like 75 countries, not in every country in the world. So a bunch of people bought the game and have been playing it from their home country and in a country where they can't get PSN. So if Sony says now PSN is required, in theory, they can no longer play the game. However, this is potentially breaking news. Here's an update on the Engadget article on this from May 7th that says, so this is just yesterday at 3 p.m. This article previously stated that Helldivers 2 was available to purchase on Steam regardless of region, but at publication, it's 
but at publication, it is still delisted in countries without PSN. Right. So here's so here's a here's a bit of confusion now. And that, those people might have bought the game. Now they can't play it. Well, but if it was if it was delisted in countries without PSN, that means they were going out of their region. They were doing they were using a VPN or they were doing whatever they were doing. They're setting their region to something else so that they they could buy the game and play the game even if it wasn't available in their country. So Sony may have no, no, done no, 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 the no. right I, thing. No, the way I read this is it was originally available. Then they pulled it out. Then when they said they dropped the PSN requirement, when they dropped the PSN requirement recently, they did not relist in those countries. I don't think they, I think when they originally bought it, the way I took this whole thing. Okay, was so this is still after it, the fact they delisted yeah. it. They, after the fact they del delisted it in the countries without PSN? Yes. Okay, yes. okay, okay, okay. Well, then it's, then it's, then it's still extra bad on Sony's part. I mean, I don't. Not that I want to be a Sony apologist because I haven't been in their universe. No, I mean, they, they I don't, did bad don't really here. have a pie in that bakery, but um. <laughs> I've not heard that one. But <laughs> I like it. They um they did they did put an indicator on Steam that PSM was going to be required. Okay, so like maybe they yellow. put they had some small fine print somewhere that said but you're still correct that they didn't set expectations because right. then when you bought it and you didn't have to that's that is what set the expectation yeah so he so here's that that was a bad thing the way sony allowed it to go out listed it in regions when it was where it wasn't supposed to be available or even even if whatever and didn't communicate it upfront in a in a very explicit way. I mean, if this was their their strategy all along, they should have been saying, get your PSN account now, you know, just on the load screen. Right. You're gonna right. need PSN if, for this eventually. Get your PSN yeah, account now. You'll be all set. Times. You know, it's it's gonna set you up for cross play. It's gonna to be remind really... you every time you log in. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that was bad. Arrowhead didn't help with that, but Arrowhead gets has very much more bad behavior coming up in the story. <laughs> so the next bad thing that happens, this comes out on May 2nd. Sony puts out the announcement. Hey, P you know, in like five, five days, four days, PSN accounts are going to be required. So, you know, get, get, get those going like we had in the fine print. And everybody went, what? So this was over a weekend. And then what happened is all the players got mad. Rightly so. And some of them, a great majority of them got mad on behalf of on behalf of people that it really impacts, which is the people that can't get a PSN account. But then also be on behalf of themselves because it was right. it was friction. Right. Um, and that's and also, you know, some of them have bad feelings about they they didn't want to have a lot they didn't want to have to log into PSN because right. whatever. Right. Whatever nobody nobody wants about. to log into extra things. We nobody likes right. the extra launcher. Nobody likes but we do it because that's how the systems work. And this And that's how the companies are able to support their games is when they can provide a certain you know, well known to them art infrastructure that right. you can go through. Right. And if, if Sony can do it this way, then maybe Sony will, will do it a lot more going forward and that would be good for us all. But still, just justified. Very, very justified because it wasn't clear up front that the communication plan didn't, you know, didn't have it coming down the road. So people got mad. However, what this whole game, the whole game is designed around uh, we almost weaponizing it for, for fun, weaponizing the community. So the community of Helldivers is designed, the way the game works and the way they sort of rally the community around community objectives. So there's community objectives in the game that say like, okay, well now this planet got invaded by these robots. And now we, as the Helldiver community, we need to bring, we need to, 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 to bring democracy to this planet. And it's it's weaponized to the point where everybody like rallies together and they get gung ho and they go do the thing, right? And it's they've been like crushing these goals. Well, all the community started to get mad at Sony and decided on their own, you know, now they've been weaponized into this into this tool, they decided to turn that weapon against Sony. Uh uh how how should they do that? They should voice their 
dis displeasure in a myriad of ways. And they started to do that. This is where Arrowhead gets into the mix and Arrowhead's bad behavior. Then that creates a loop with the player's bad behavior, which goes off the rails completely. So Arrowhead gets in the mix and Arrowhead, uh, the CEO, mildly bad, sort of just waffling, not really coming out with clear statements about, you know, yeah, you know, we, we messed up on the communication. He was more just sort of going, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do about this with these people that, uh, to, I think there was like, somebody said, Hey, I bought it in in my country. This was like on Twitter. I bought it in my country, blah, blah, blah. What do I do about that? And he replied on Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay for one that's that's not great but he he was they, he, they've been hammered under, under under a ton of pressure there was a community manager the though this guy named spitz and spitz has been kind of a a bit of a point of friction with the community in their discord like blunt and just like not very community manager ish you think of the, like the best community managers out there they can take it they never dish it back they right. uh, they communicate, you know, with a smile on their face, even when they're getting tomatoes thrown at them. Spitz wasn't that way. And Spitz, Spitz comes out with a statement on X and on social network, probably, in, I think, in the Discord, too, which basically said, yeah, this is a bunch of crap. You know, I think you guys should go review bomb the game. Basically, you know, par paraphrasing, but. Pretty, you know, that's yeah, pretty, that's, pretty that's directly. a pretty good paraphrase. Yeah. Well, I mean, what he said was, you know, complaining here does no good. If you complain on Steam, then they'll see it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, yeah, com complaining to me, the community manager, is is not effective. Yeah. Go complain on Steam. So over the weekend, two hundred thousand negative reviews. So the this was like overwhelmingly positive game. It suddenly tanked down to mixed, and I'm I'm sure you know black helicopters were flying around the the publisher studio and the and the dev studio. And as of yesterday, Sony uh, no two days ago, Sony backtracked. Sony said, "Well, fine, we won't do the PSN uh, requirement." At this time, I didn't read their complete statement, but they backed down. They're not doing the PSN requirement, at least right now. Uh, that That's huge. So, and then just to cap it all off before I sort of explain where I think all of the, the bad behavior really came down was um, Spitz immediately after that, like put up a couple posts saying, well, I'm vindicated. You know, man, I, I, I did it. I stuck it to him. Um, and then he got fired, uh, you know, which I don't know the guy. I don't, I don't know the person. I'm sure that person, you know, I'm sure Spitz was under tremendous pressure as well. This is, you can't, you can't take an indie team and like give them a thousand times the influx of players and pressure that they expected and ex expect them to, to hold up all the, all that well. Right. Um, that was going to be one of my points too. It's like, <laughs> This whole thing, this wild success must have been such a high for them. And then all of a sudden this disaster. Right. So I would have fired Spitz from that role at least. He was he was not that that it, that was very unprofessional, all of the things that he did. You don't throw your publisher, your business partners under the bus. As a community manager, you your personal opinion doesn't matter. You weaponizing the player base against a business partner that probably helped fund the game or at least helped make it as, as successful as it is, is in no way appropriate and pro professional. He's, he's got, he's, he's a, pro he's a professional. He's got a job to do. Um, so I, I, I don't think that that was, and the, the community didn't really like it from, from what I read from the different, um, yeah, well, it's a Forster ben, bench and train to demote to a different role. But if if his only skill set and contribution is community management, then what do you do? Um, we we don't need you as a community manager anymore. If you can find another job to do in our small indie studio, I mean, do you have coding skills? We'll we'll get you we'll get we'll get you doing that. If you don't, I don't know what what you're gonna do. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
So I think there was bad behavior on Sony's part, which was the, both the communication and then the way this was pushed out. You can't do it that quickly, and it's, it's problematic. I think there was also bad behavior on Arrowhead's part, and the, 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 the statements that they were coming out from them were wishy-washy from the CEO's perspective and completely terrible approach from the community management's perspective. And then I really, I know the player base thinks that they did an awesome thing and they won against, you know, Sony, the big bad. And uh, I just do not, I've never liked, and I've ranted against it before, this weaponization of reviews. And now this will bolster the, you know, the gamer community, the capital G gamers, to think that this is the way to handle everything moving forward. Anytime you don't get the thing that you want, <clears throat> what you do is you review bomb and you trash the game and you make it terrible for everyone involved um, so that you get that one thing changed. Hey guys, let's all get together and and tear tear burn this house to the ground, you know, because because I don't want to have a PSN account. Um, what percentage of them probably have PSN accounts? A lot of them were doing it on behalf of the people that they thought that were really impacted, which were the people that weren't going to be able to play the game going forward. Um, that's, I guess that's righteous anger and you're, you're fine with doing that. I would bet a very significant percentage of them were doing it because they were just part of the community and they were jumping on the bandwagon. It's a fun thing to do. It burned, it's, oh, what? We're, we're, what are we burning down today? Let's let's all go do that. Um, so I, I, while while protest for positive for for good is a good thing, I weaponizing feedback so that you, throwing a tantrum as a community to get what you want is only going to end up in in tears. For the industry and for us as as gamers, small G gamers, um, and getting games made, um, and getting things communicated out, and ha having things, you know, th th <laughs> this is why we won't be able to have nice things in the future. Yeah. So I get, and Double Agent has made a couple comments that uh, you know Sony, Sony and PSN have been bad with security breaches in the past, and well, no, I mean. That's kind of neither here nor there. Right. I mean, I that, but that is what some people said. They didn't. They wanted the option not to go through PSN because they feared the security. Which, I, I guess, I guess that's a reason. But that, in no way would that. But be I, enough of a reason for Sony to not do it. Right. Right. Um, and that's not right. an and argument the, that's going to sway sway Sony at all. And it's because Sony... it doesn't sway Bethesda. It doesn't. It's, it doesn't sway Microsoft. Yeah. It doesn't sway anyone else in the industry. And they all do it. Right. And what Sony was, what what what's on their, wrote what they're trying to get to is a point where they can release stuff on PlayStation and PC at the same time. So what they're trying to do, the overall goal, is good for us. Right. Right. Forrester is saying, what alternative do they have when there's a legitimate concern? They have... <laughs> You're right. You, this, there are a few avenues to sort of really make your voice heard. You can do, you can do returns you know, of, of the game. You can you know, demand you know, reverse charges. You can go out and put your, neg your thumbs down on Steam. I just don't think it's as, as good a tool as everybody thinks well, that I mean it is. Your alternative is to talk to the um, community management, just make, like yeah, no, well, yeah, make complain about that thing, not use that thing to trash the game. Right, right. That it's it's not like they didn't know, and it's not like the community community management didn't know, and it's not like it wasn't communicated, and it's not like the community didn't make their voice known. They just decided that they were going to use this weaponized tool of downvote into a, a black hole to make a point about this thing. So when the next thing comes up, the next the next problem, they'll just do it do that again. Why not? And when the next game has has a problem because they don't like the color purple on the new weapon skin, they'll just downvote the game into oblivion. And this that that pattern of reinforced behavior is what's going to just sort of be bad for us all. Um so let's look right now Steam um hell divers. 
Um, cause everybody got what they want, right? So if, if, if the community was doing this appropriately and they got what they want and they won, then we should be back to overwhelmingly positive reviews on steam, right? Um, let's take a little look, see here. Um, this game may not inappropriate. Nope. Nope. It's still, so it was mostly positive, uh, overall and recent reviews are all mixed. So all those people that, uh, you're saying, look at the graph. How do I look at the graph? Um, show graph. Okay, so of the 200,000, um, about 40% of them came back and, and marked it positive again. <clears throat> so you still have 60% that left it out there as negative um, and said, so this, this is actually better than I expected. Um, so here, so, so 80,000, 85,000 positive were, were marked positive in the, the past few days. And now it's sort of like tapered off to zero again. Um, so 120,000, 60% have decided that even though they won and they got what they want and they're not necessarily unjustified in this, but it's like, well, they lost our trust now. They're not going to go back no matter what happens now. So even though they think that they won, they they trashed the game. It's it's mixed going forward, and or they got on the bandwagon, but then they didn't really care that much, so they didn't stay informed. Right. So they don't even know it's changed. It was it was a meme activity. It wasn't people that were so passionate they now hate the game, because all those people are still playing the game. So they don't actually dislike the game. Maybe they're still just so angry that they have to have a PSN account because no other game that they play does anything like this and they're so confused. You know, the, you, you can justify it lots of different ways and it's, it's for any individual, it's completely justified to, you know, downvote it, you know, mark, give a negative review and keep a negative review for any individual. For a meme activity like this to 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 have this now be a tool in the arsenal of capital g gamers i just don't think is is great is, is a great thing and we'll see we'll see if uh, going forward if if what what happens to the next you know studio that does something interesting and yeah you know, now we decided that if this is the color that we don't like this this week uh, any game that has this color in it gets downvoted and that, that studio has to go out of business. I don't know. We'll see. One of the things that I'm gets being me dramatic, about this, of course, but we've talked about this before is, uh, is the communication side of it. It's like, yeah. Why is this a lesson that never gets learned? I, I don't know. And from, from either Sony or, Arrowhead's communication department. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's that's that's Sony's biggest flaw. I mean, Sony is a company that should have this well understood and nailed down. You you do a risk assessment. What what would happen if down the road we suddenly require PSN? Um, we're gonna like turn that on at some point. Wow, we better get ahead of that. I mean, somebody should come up with that. <laughs> well, even before that, though. Originally, like we were saying before, they they didn't communicate. Right. Yeah. We, I, that, yeah. I'm saying. And, like, and how many times have we sat in 2023? In this should have been on the communication plan. Right. Like how, how this? How many things have we seen in games that by themselves were a minor issue, but the fact that it was a surprise yeah. made it a major issue. Yeah. That's that's the root problem to to this situation is Sony screwed up. You know, and. End, end of message in terms of root problem. Then there was a bunch of spiraling, spiraling bad behavior after that uh, on all sides. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know why they, they would think that that, that that would just be fine. I mean, they're new to it, I guess. They're new to this idea of trying to go cross-platform. And, uh, and, you know, 
a corporation. We we. But they've stepped in it before in this same way. I know, way. I know. But uh, we we sometimes forget a corporation is just people. And you might think that, well, they've got 100,000 people that work for, for Sony. They should be able to figure this out. Not 100,000 people working on this. It could just be a couple, you know, to like three 20-year-olds, you know, this is their, 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 their first job in corporate communications. They've got a degree. They, they are, they are, they're smart, but they've not, never seen this situation before either. So they screwed up they, and now they'll, now be, they know and they'll learn. There should be a document or a set of documents at Sony that says when you communicate. There should be, but you know, there's not. With the public. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there should be, in, they should right. prioritize it no, so that there is. Yeah. It's not easy. I'm not in it's in easy. the places that handle this better. It's easier than are, doing this. It, it, that does exist. Yeah. Yeah. Different culture, different business culture. Um, For sure. Different community culture. You you could you you know there's different gamer player bases around the world where you could say i'm sorry uh now for all of us to to work together we're you're gonna have to um stand up out of your chair and hop on one foot for uh for 10 seconds to, to launch the game and they would go okay okay all right let's do that um you try that you try that with other subcultures in the community and like with capital g gamers and it's like that's not gonna that's not gonna fly all right, so that's 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 that. This fun little trip down uh, hell review, hell divers debacle. What not to do? Lessons learned. I will take notes for uh, the communication plan for my mega corporation <laughs> studio publishing network when I um, am the lord and king of one. That's what that's how that works in business, right? They have lords and kings. Um, so like. Yeah, like my favorite thing is when you say to someone, "Well, you should communicate that," and they say, "No, they should already know that." <laughs> I'm like, "I guarantee you, they do not already know that." <laughs> right? Or they don't. They do not already know did, anything. We did communicate it. It was it was in the you know paragraph number seven point four <laughs> of the newsletter. <laughs> I can't help it if they don't read the newsletter. <laughs> Yeah. It was posted did, outside the bathroom. Did you communicate it to them every day in their face? <laughs> did did you communicate it seven times in the last 10 minutes? <laughs> then you didn't communicate it. Right. All right. On the more fun side of the news, we got we got a tweet of a Reddit post of a screenshot of a post that turned <laughs> out to be Timothy Omenson on his own Instagram, and this is where I encourage you to go look and follow and like the the origin of this. Timothy Omen said, May the 4th be with you. I'm thrilled to finally be able to announce that last week, the nice people at SWOTOR Official invited me back to the recording booth to reprise my role of Eric Jorgen. So nice to pick up the blaster again and get back to fighting for the Republic. Hashtag Havoc Squad. Awesome. 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 Uh, Timothy Omison is someone we are a fan of, uh, yeah. as these replies are saying, 2,500 likes in the last four days. I'm such a big fan of your work as Eric. Uh, good to see. But yeah. And then if you're the person out there that wants to uh, forward this or retweet this, put the link to his Instagram in your, <laughs> in your right. message. Because right. I did. It's I did. I'd like dig all. and dig and dig. Uh, it was, I, I found it as like a retweet of someone who tweeted it. And what they tweeted was a link to a Reddit post. And what the Reddit post was, was a screenshot of this post on Reddit, on Instagram, which then meant I had to like go out and go to Instagram physically and find Timothy Omenson's um, Instagram account. And because you did all that, I was able to go just directly to Instagram. <laughs> yes. And then I spread this link around. Yeah. Well, to see yeah. but I, that's spread, spread the source link. Uh, there's another event starting in Fallout 76. I'll talk a little bit about what I, what I've been playing, but there's a new event there. I just threw, I thought I'd throw it in the news because why not more events? I'm going to talk about events some, uh, after the, the break as well, but, uh, it's a, this spring cleaning event. It's just two weeks and there's a checklist of things you do. I, you had a good question, Simo, which was the way they described it is the wasteland of Appalachia is about to get, to get a fresh makeover as Bethesda introduces the spring cleaning event. Nothing's happening. There's no fresh makeover. I know they 
sort of like using that in the little blurb, but this is just like a spring checklist of something you do. There's two, it's two, like for week one, you have to do these things and then you wait till week two, week two, you have to do eight things and then you get like a couple cosmetics and that's it. So I did it all in like, like 45 minutes. Um, we, I did all of week one in like 45. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it's supposed to be. And I don't know why it's overlapping the alien event, but Hey, there's another event out there <laughs> that I throw that in. Uh, fun, fun, fun. I thought it was a really cool idea to like, if you wanted to make updates to a zone to somehow have the players involved, like they, Right. They did that in a while with the yeah. with the island of Keldenas, where you did certain activities and then it would open certain buildings and stuff like that uh, until the whole aisle was all built out. I think that is a really good, cool idea, cool concept. Uh, have everyone be part of that. I, I wonder if there's a way that they could do this in Star Wars The Old Republic. What they're doing right now is as they make updates to various parts of the game, they're redoing sort of like the textures and updating the graphics for some of the original planets, as an example. Now, that's a little bit different. They're not actually changing things around. Um, but still, I wonder if there would be some sort of in-universe way to say, um, like, if everybody gathers enough space goggles, everyone's vision will get clearer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you did it. Now everything is more in focus and sharper. You can see the texture is so much better on your screen. Um, the way they're doing it as a zone evolves kind of thing. That is, I think that is really fun for a community. Any of those kind of community objectives. When No Man's Sky has a community objective, it's usually optional to sort of get the event complete in case it doesn't happen for whatever reason. But it's, I like having it on there. It is a fun thing. And it does make it seem like everyone's working together. Like in Helldivers, when everyone works together <laughs> to conquer a planet and destroy a studio. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I now, Seema, we uh, have a rundown of a bunch of games that are releasing. You want to name yeah. a couple of these of your favorites off on here? <laughs> these are mostly... <laughs> Oh, mine, oh yeah, my but... favorite V Rising. <laughs> are you you're not gonna play V Rising at all, are you? No. <laughs> v Rising, it came out today, 1.0. I think we have a server. Yes, we do. We have a server. New Overlords and AIE are sharing a server. Nazrai, our amazing one of the leaders in our community, who's got basically a rack server infrastructure in his basement, containerized cloud infrastructure of his own, his personal cloud is now running a vRising server on top of all the other servers that he's running for us, which include like Conan and Ark and Valheim and like 50 other servers. <laughs> anyway, vRising server is available. If you jump in <clears throat> newoverlords.com slash discord, I posted in the, our main general channel. You can see there's a, a pinned post. It's just, it's just right there of what the vRising server is. It's PVE. Let's all be nice and, and work together. But Feel free to jump in there. I got in there, dropped, got far enough just to drop a place for my castle where I, I like to have it, even though the map has changed since I played in early access. Um, Forrester's in there, I know. There's only going to be a handful of us in, in there at, at most, but there, and it's also in the AIE Nomads channel. Um, come play. I'm going to be playing it quite a bit over the course of the next week. I'm going to hit it hard for the next week. Um, probably not too much after that because... And then we'll talk about it on the podcast next week of the, the new things that have happened since I played it, you know, months, years ago in early access. Yeah. I'll look up when, when I played it. Yeah, that was a while ago. But uh, I want to try out the new stuff and the sort of the pre, pre-launch pre expansions that they even added in. But next week on Wednesday, the Starfield spring update comes out. So we're going to be going to, I'm going to be back in Starfield the, the week after that. And then we I certainly have Star Wars, the old Republic and arc and fallout 76. <laughs> I need to be doing dailies and weeklies and personal objectives on. Huh. So as a result, I have not played manor Lords, <laughs> but that came out this week too. Uh, manor Lords was that city builder game that we had talked about. Uh, uh, which apparently is a single 
single developer who's d done this amazing work. They keep saying single developer, and I'm not disbelieving, but I don't believe it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, maybe it is. Maybe it's just a single person. But I, I think, yeah, it, I think what that could mean is a single person who's got his hands in or her hands in everything, but they, they, you know, might farm some, not farm some out, but use other companies to do some parts. Definitely used, you know, well, if, if mocap. Yeah, I don't know. It, is he, did he personally do the motion capture him, himself and the photogrammetry he personally? I mean, obviously you, you're, you sort of like buy a bunch of assets for this kind of thing too. Um, it's taken him seven years. Well, you could say it's taken him seven years, but photogrammetry has only been in for a year in Unreal. Um, well, maybe a single person. Uh, regardless, it's well reviewed, <laughs> and people are are it's it's got positive reviews. It's a city builder. You got to like city builders to to play it. Um, it looks pretty amazing to me, regardless. And yeah, for all. For all reports, it's a, a single developer doing amazing work out there. So very cool. Uh, if 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 I can find some time, I definitely want to get into it and play it. Um, I'm not guaranteeing that I will find that time, uh, but it's the kind of game that uh, I I can get into and really like um, from time to time. These kind of city builder games. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, so Starfield. We said Starfield's definitely having its update next week we will be talking about that next in two weeks we'll probably be talking about the starfield update because it'll be coming out on wednesday next week lars who we've had on the show before has been doing a playthrough sort of getting ready he's been doing a playthrough for months now and has now cap taken all of his captures and he's publishing it episode by episode on his channel of just his straight up playthrough casual playthrough of starfield Lars Gagner Gaming at Lars Gagner Gaming YouTube slash at Lars Gagner Gaming. Go check it out. Uh, Lars is great, and we'll have Lars on in two weeks. We'll have to see how we're gonna work that into his schedule. He is his character's name. He refers to it as the Professor. He uses the Professor perk. He's a professor in real life, so it kind of fits. I like when he says, "Let's see what the Professor's doing today." I'm like, "Are you talking about yourself in the third person?" No, it's his, char it's his character. <laughs> Um, but he is a professor as well. So that's quite cool. Uh, check it out. And we will talk about it when that comes up. Another one that a, a friend of ours is very into, uh, and I'm very excited, which is coming out on the 13th. So in just a few days is Homeworld 3. So Homeworld 3 is RTS, real-time strategy. Um, use necessary cookies only. These cookies, there's another rant, these cookie pop-ups on every website. Homeworld 3 is a very, very cool real-time strategy game. Corley, who we also have had on the podcast many times, he's also our ops leader, tells us what to do. He's boss man. Uh, <laughs> Homeworld 3 is their third iteration of this real-time strategy game. So you can th kind of think of like a StarCraft, but in space, actually in outer space. And in 3D. So the real the thing I love about Homeworld and the way it works is you're you've got all this fleet of spaceships and you're you gotta like mine some asteroids to get the resources, then you make different kinds of spaceships and you position your spaceships to attack the enemy fleet. But as you do this, which is what I love when space games do this correctly, is you align all of your spaceships in a 3D space. So Think the enemy gate is down. Think there is no there is no up there or, or down. You're in a 3D model of the, the play arena. And you can configure your ships into formations. And those formations are 3D formations. It's not just a flat plane and a you know a V-shaped formation. They can be like in a sphere. And then you take your sphere. Of, of ships and engage the enemy ships with it. And you'll play with different formations and you'll take different groups of your ships and position them in different places above and below the plane of, of rotation of the galaxy or whatever that you're playing in. 
that's the way a space game should work. It's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around it when you first start playing it, but once you do, it's it's so cool. It's it's the way to think about space that that's really excellent. There's no up or down. There's no there's no top or bottom. There's no north, south, east, west. There's there's just three dimensions. It's like Vashir. Mm-hmm. Fly, yeah, swimming around. Completely underwater. That's that's the same thing. With so many space games though, they always have like an up. And your right. spaceships are all I, and, I, yes, are, yes. Are, are, yeah, Star Wars does this. These fleets fly together and they're all like on the exact same plane and they all like warp in and they're all in the same plane. And they're all oriented the same way. That's not the way, I mean, if we ever do have a space war, that's not the way space, space combat is going to work. Uh, so very, very fun, very cool, very interesting. Um, you ever heard of Hades, Seema? Because the world has. I never played <laughs> Hades, though. Hades 1. I know it's like the most awesome thing uh, ever, and people love it, and I should play it, but Unfortunately, I did not play it. It's not the kind of, it's sort of that action-y um, mm -hmm. roguelike yeah. kind of game. Yeah. And huge acclaim for Hades 1. Very, I think it was kind of like game of the year list kind of things when it originally came out. And Hades 2 Early Access is now available as of two days ago. I think... Everybody is going to be that uh, sort of this kind of like roguelike action RPG shooter bullet hell kind of game fan is going to love this. So very happy to see it out, out there. If you do end up playing it and come in our discord and tell me I should try it and play it. Um, I don't know if again, I don't know if I'll get the time, but I will put it on my list because, yeah, I know it's beloved. That's really cool. And then finally, last one I put on the list, Seema, because we've been talking about it uh, and people keep telling us about it. Yeah. Is this Star Wars Hunter mobile game. So multiple people in our ops night, on our fun night on Tuesday night in Star Wars The Old Republic said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm greatly, I'm anticipating this game. I can't wait until it comes out. I really want to see what they're doing with this Star Wars Hunter's mobile game on iOS and Android. So it's like an action fight, like a fighting action game, kind of from the outside. We haven't seen a lot of the gameplay yet, but it kind of looks like Overwatch to me, where it's sort of squad based and you have different characters with different abilities, but it's an action fighting game. I don't know if there's sort of like map objectives or if it's just battle royale or if it's just squad versus squad PVP, but I find those games pretty difficult to play on mobile devices. You're sliding directional with your left thumb by sliding it around on the screen. You're tapping virtual buttons with your right thumb on a screen and you're cramping your hands up like this to try to hold a mobile device to, to make it happen. There are accessories for mobile devices. There's a device called a backbone, which I think could make this kind of game really sing for a mobile player but kind of then defeats the purpose of having a mobile game just to have a, your phone in your pocket and be out there at the bus stop and whip it out and do a, excuse me while I whip this out, uh, do, do a little mobile game. We did get a, a, another preview image that someone sent us as well. Didn't we? Um, was it strike zone? I think strike zone posted in our discord and said, this is another of the characters that they've unveiled that they can't wait. Uh, to, to see live in the Star Wars Hunters game, which is... So apparently, you the, the in-game universe, you have to enroll as a, a, a hunter in this arena, uh, but you can only enroll as a single person. So these two <laughs> Jawa brothers decided one was going to stand on the shoulders of the other and cover themselves with a trench coat and enter as a uh, as a single a bounty hunter person to fight. And also, <clears throat> I mean, that character's name is U Utuni. <laughs> Utuni. Yeah. And I love the two guys in a trench coat idea in any implementation. In, in any setting, TV shows, everything. And it fits so well. In modern Star Wars, I said you could just put you could put uh, 
tiny uh, uh, child Princess Leia under, under there too. She would fit right in. And and then you got uh, that was in the Obi Wan show. <laughs> it was just an amazing scene. <laughs> They're walking through the middle of an Imperial base. They're in the heart, in the middle of Imperial base, walking through the landing bay, surrounded by people, just like walking past them. <laughs> and it's Imperial officer who is a a, 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 a rebel agent. Uh, Ewan McGregor, and he's got a big trench coat, and then there's a little Leia. Who's under his trench coat, walking along? <laughs> They're just like, just walking along. Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody, nobody notices. So that was that was amazing. So I want a little Easter egg of Leia peeks her head out of that trench coat as well. Tons of games, aren't there, Seema? Yeah, so many games. It hasn't slowed down in 2024 from 2023. No, I thought it was really going to slow down. Now, these aren't necessarily as huge a games as were coming out at the end of last year. But but really, really cool games being released. I mean, like Homeworld, Homeworld 3, if you're an RTS fan, you should really be looking at that. Corley showed off his collector's edition box. He got the physical collector's edition, and it comes with a model of the mothership that's that lit up and goes on a stand. And I'm jealous. I would love that. I would love to put it on my shelf behind me. So now I, I, I I'm, I'm gonna play Homeworld three. I just don't know how much I'm gonna play of it. But I would now. I want the the box just so I can have that mothership. That is so cool. Corley has been a backer for many years. I guess Homeworld three had a Kickstarter or a launch or a pre order kind of thing, and I think he. He did that like five years ago. So he is one of the biggest fans of Homeworld in general. He bought me a copy of Homeworld 2 just to get into it and play it and learn it. And I loved it. So that's cool. V Rising, as I said, will be in and Starfield next week. Those are the big ones for me. Um, cool to see all of these other games coming out as well. All right, that's it for the news. As always, thanks to all of you out there for following and listening. If you need any of the subscribe links for audio or video, everything is on newoverlords.com. Special thanks to everyone that hangs out with us live here on Twitch or in our Discord, where we talk about fun stuff pretty much all day, every day. And also, don't forget, if you're looking for that big, family-friendly gaming community, check out Alea Yacht Est. That's the guild that we play in for most of our games, especially our MMOs that Seema and I play. It's aie-guild.org for the AIE Discord, and we'll get you the invites, especially to our SWOTOR Guild, which is hopping lately. It's hopping. Excellent, excellent. All right, Simo, we haven't got to talk about it in a while, but I think we get to talk about what's been on our personal menus. It looks like meat's back on our menu, boys. No way. Oh, God. God. Yeah. Finally. Oh, my God. Yeah. God. I like the maggoty bread. I did like the maggoty bread as well. <laughs> All right, we went much longer on the news than I intended. This always happens. We went deep into hell divers, but yes, I, I had many words, opinions. I had words yeah, to say. Me too. Yes. It, it rarely happens that I've I have <laughs> opinions to get out there. So, what have you been playing, Seema? What have you been playing? Well. Since Galactic Seasons 6 started and Star Wars The Old Republic, I've been working on that. And I've been doing it on um, Starforge and Shea Vizsla, which is two different servers, which means I'm actually doing two different. And I know I'm not the only person who does that. There's people who do it on four servers. But yeah, so I'm doing Galactic Seasons on two different servers. It doesn't mean you can like stand on both servers and do it one time. <laughs> like, you know you're riding two horses it's like means you do everything twice so that's kind of crazy yeah so um you're doing are you doing like seven objectives per week on both i'm doing well if they're sometimes yeah it depends yeah that's it's crazy something. but like last week i did because there were seven that were easy for easily done right like if yeah if they're not then i don't i don't stress on shea Vizla if i don't get all of them and i'm not trying to get the meta on jay Vizla. okay like i'm not I, that, going that's for... gonna be my next question yeah um and we're gonna talk about blueprint fragments i think that's yes we are <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so i've been doing that but that's kind of like my coffee contemplation time 
when the first time I game in that during the day, get my coffee and, and do a little um, Galactic Seasons or Conquest in Star Wars The Old Republic. And then in the evenings, a couple times a week, then I run with some operations teams. Um, so that's my rating fix in Star Wars The Old Republic. So that's kind of my my deal there but i've also been playing um well let's stay on star wars we'll go we'll go game okay. by game okay let's go so let's, okay let's, let's do that let's stay yeah. on star wars let's talk about well let's talk let's explain the blue blueprint frag, fragment thing but then we can talk about what else we've been doing in star wars and the other fun stuff but yeah this this idea so, of the meta achievement right and having objectives for meta achievements we've yes. i think we've explained this in the past one of the meta achievements is there's there's this token that drops you kill these mo you kill mobs personally there's a little buff so that you get more of them that drop and you get them when you do some of the objectives, you get a small amount, but they made the limit really high this round and they made Not the, the limit, the target, the target. Yeah. The target for the meta achievement really high. And all you get is an extra decoration for doing this part of the meta achievement. Right. Um, but yeah, the blueprint fragment limit is what's like 1500. Uh, yeah. It's a target. Again, not a limit, but yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Tar it probably target. is a limit too. You probably can't get more than 1,500. Oh, they might keep dropping. They're just trash. It yeah. just ups the counter and then is like a trash item in your inventory. You don't do anything with it. It's not, has no value really, but. But it's it's kind of finely balanced because you, they don't drop unless you run this buff. And yeah. the buff is, is the item to give you the buff is a reward from the Galactic Seasons. Um, which I mistakenly clicked on on a character that I'm not going to do oh. any farming on, and I I just was going through trying to clean up, right? And I forgot that these things are wow. character bound, which nothing else hardly in Star Wars: The Old Republic is, but these are. And um, okay, so there's that, but you can buy them. Yeah, I bought one with, this week. You can buy them with. Um, Jawa junk, the, right? But you can also buy them with the um, the things you get from Galactic the Galactic Seasons token. Oh, really? Yeah. So, like, that's one answer to, for people who are like, "Who should I spend my tokens on?" Well, like, if you're going for the meta, you can buy one of those buffs there. Yeah, but the Galactic fleet. Season tokens are sort of rare and valuable. I would not spend them. Yes, on you only get eight per stuff. season or seven per season or whatever. I think it's eight. Um, but if you if you've already bought the big things and you're thinking, what should I buy? That's a possibility. The Or if you just need to make room. Right. Because Cause you have a cap of 15 that you can hold. Right. But I would I would not recommend that. If Jawa junk is easy enough to get, which yeah. is sort of like a, another kind of weird extra currency that just sort of lingers out there in a physical form in your inventory. I have stacks of it. I have tens of thousands of, of the Jawa junk. It's 500 of the purple ones to buy one of these one hour buffs, but I bought one and I used it. So if you, d you, you did, did you do the grinding? You did the grinding to try to get them I outside of the early on. I did it play. once on one of my characters. It was, I did it on a Sork. Did I, or did I do it last season? Cause they had a, they had a similar buff last season. I don't think I've done it yet with blueprint fragment, but um, we have pretty much determined that, I mean, people say they do drop out in the world without the buff, but I have not seen that happen. Maybe like, like one a week. I've... Maybe, but every time I've gotten one, I could look back and see that I actually completed something. Yeah, they're they're if, super rare, if if at all. Like if As you opposed do, to if previous you complete... seasons, they would just drop, and then when you use yeah. the buff, they just dropped a lot more. Right, so. and this is. Um, the w every day there's a little objective that's called influencing the galaxy. All you have to do is get twenty five thousand conquest points, which is hard not to do if you're playing all at all. That thing gives one blueprint fragment. So if you see that you got a blueprint fragment in your inventory, you might scroll back and chat and see that you hit influencing the galaxy and not necessarily that it dropped. Yeah. We took a look kind of did the math everybody's been kind of doing the math to try to, try to see are we going to hit this 1500 are we going to hit this target and if even if you're hardcore and you do all of you do seven objectives which is the most you can do per week and you do those every week all the way through way beyond 
completing the season. So you complete the season, and then there's a meta achievement to do 100 objectives, and you do all of those. That's another meta achievement. And then you keep doing it, and you don't even go on vacation. And every single week of every of, of the whole season, you do seven objectives. You still won't reach the 1,500 1, target, which is weird. So that's where I think the, the math is kind of off. Because like if the most hardcore people just by playing the game are not going to hit the target, uh, the only if you do certain kinds of group content, you do get some as well. So if you're if you're a hardcore operations runner, yes. and you're, yes. especially if you're doing vet and master mode operations, and you're doing two or three of those a week, well, then you're going to be getting a, a fair amount, and you will probably and you're doing all the objectives, you will probably hit it. Yeah. Yeah, that'll make that'll make a huge difference. But even us that do operations weekly as well, and all of those, we're 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 still gonna have to grind mobs. So I did that this week. I tested it. I did the thing where I got the buff. I went to CZ one ninety eight, which is a place where you can do a bunch of daily missions, and part of one of the missions is like kill thirty five guys. And then there's a part in the basement where you go down there, and there's basically womp rats and there's packs of six of them and there's one two three four five six seven packs of them basically down there so you, you can kill all of those and then if you go out and that and then there's like a thing you click to finish that little instance and it's personal so other people aren't aren't in there you can step back out the door reset that phase and go back in and kill those seven packs again and you can do that over and over and over and I did that over and over and over for an hour. After about 20 minutes, I nearly stopped and said, well, I, I understand the math formula now. <laughs> uh, but then I found something to watch on YouTube or something and just and I kept it up for an hour. And I got 73 blueprint fragments for doing I that. I mean, that 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 is a lot. Because like when I did it before in another season with a buff, I got like 25 in an hour. I mean, I'm guessing that you're like way more efficient than I was because I was out in the world with my Sork and I was killing the bugs on Tatooine, which is they're not grouped as tightly as those animals that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this was this was like 40 to 50 every couple minutes. Yeah. Because you're just like, yeah. bam, 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 bam. After you clear it once, those force fields are down. So it's basically. What as, I was thinking, it's what I was thinking fast. I might do is. On one of my, I have to decide which character, but on one of my characters, get a buff and then do like three um, daily areas, like do Andron and Oricon and Black Hole and CZ198 or whatever, if I, if I could get those all done in an hour and see what I come up with then. Because that I can kind of, I can kind of think about doing. The idea of resetting that one instance and going back in and over and over and over again, I can't even face that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I and, I and I can't believe that's what they want us to do. Right. I wouldn't think that that's what they want us to do either or that they want us to be grinding at all. I mean, that's not right. how they've been about anything in the game design. So I, I think it's a little bit off. We've I'm, I'm a little bit unconvinced whether I will grind it at all. We'll see. Right. I mean, because of what you've mentioned that I just have a lot to do right now. And I'm not even talking about real life. I'm yeah. talking about unreal life. I have no. a lot to do. Unreal life. <laughs> Welcome to my unreal life. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So if there's if I do it more than two more times by the end of the season, I probably just won't do it. If you do it two more times, though, that'll be plenty, right? I mean, even that'll doing be 150. It one time, it might be I, but I have to get like set. I have to get more than you per week. I'm still behind you, even after doing that. Really? Uh, oh, but I went through. I went through and took took them all out of the. Um, oh, I haven't track. done that. You get like an extra. Yeah, you got to do that before you do the math because it's mis. It you're you're right. You don't get a pure picture. It does. It's it's misrepresenting. Yeah. All right. I'll do. I'll do a game now that I've been playing. Uh, oh, yeah, here's where I can do my little talk. <laughs> but first, before I talk about what <laughs> games I've been playing, let's describe cloud computing. Uh, actually, just IT, uh, IT architecture, uh, event-driven computing. So there's different ways that you can arrange a computing system. You can have an, a direct, tightly coupled, or even loosely coupled APIs. 
I have a purchasing system. And when somebody comes to the website and they make an order, I call an API to execute that order. I call another API to send the email. I call a third API to, to log the order to our, our auditing receipt system. Another way to do that is what's called event-driven architecture. <laughs> this is going to make sense in a, in a moment to everyone. <laughs> I, I'm logging into WoW right now to do some archaeology. <laughs> in event-driven architecture, you basically have a publish-subscribe mechanism for the computing system itself where you say, someone comes to the website, they make an order. I put the order itself as a message in a message queue somewhere in a system. You have a broker. These are all computing terms in sort of the, the backend server infrastructure. You put that message out there into the message queue. And when that message then gets picked up by the subscriber, you'll have a bunch of subscriber systems that then will be listening for those messages and take action. So it's event driven. The event happens and the subsystems that are out there take action based on that event. Okay, why does this matter? Why does this make sense in gaming? Because I've realized a lot of the way that we play games these days are event-driven. We're event, I'm becoming very mm -hmm. event-driven in the way that I play games in general. So I will be like out of a game until an event happens and that event will drive the behavior. It gets published. The event gets published by the publisher, the game system, the, the game team. And I'm a subscriber to these event systems and I like them. And I take action when those events come up. So you talked about your coffee and contemplation time. That's, that, that's kind of what I do in the mornings is I look at the, <laughs> I listen to the message queue where those events are getting published. and I, as the personal subscriber to those event queues, decide what I'm going to, what, what events I'm going to consume off those queues each day. All right. So now that we've got the architecture talk, but today, <laughs> done. The first that I've been doing quite a bit is all of the events in uh, Fallout 76. There's sort of three tracks of events that are going on right now. One is season 16 which is sort of like the season kind of events. The season events have a daily set of objectives and they usually is eight per day and there's weekly objectives, there's usually eight per week. Those come up each day. So I go in there usually and I'm, I've been doing all of my dailies and weeklies in Fallout 76 for the, for the past two weeks, which is how long I've been playing Fallout 76. So that's one of the events that I've been following and it's been, it's been fun. I like these in game systems because they are designed when they're designed well to get you to try out a bunch of different parts of the game. And they're kind of tricking you into having fun with more of the game systems themselves. And if, if a game team, if a game developer tricks you into having fun, you're still having fun, even yes. though you got tricked into having fun, which is fun. So yeah. I like the, the dailies and the weeklies that get you to go different things. Some of it's just like, oh, go kill 10 mutants. Uh, sometimes it'll be go Go pick up five cans. Go pick up five cans of dog food and eat them. <laughs> That's an objective that comes up <laughs> relatively often. Eat five cans of dog food. <laughs> I don't know why, but it is. This week you have I have a higher threshold for gross than I do. This week I have to plant 25 plants. That's one of my weekly objectives. 25. I had to find or or make and and scrap, deconstruct. 25 different pieces of headwear. Uh, I just ended up just making them real quick because I'm flush with materials. I made them and scrapped them. It took me, you know, 17 seconds. It was it was really fast and easy. Uh, but still, you then I realized also, it just gets you, then I'm like, oh, I can make these interesting hats. <laughs> now I've got new hats that I can wear. <laughs> so that's one of the events. The second event that's a two-week event that started last week and it'll be done on Tuesday is the Alien Invasion event. The alien invasion event is interesting. It's very future retro or retro future. Yeah, retro futuristic. It's what like the 1950s view of alien invasion would look like. Big flying saucer appears in the sky. It happens at the top of the hour, once an hour. It's a community event. You usually get between about, I've done it with as few as three people, but usually there's about 10, 12 people. It's, it's only more 25 fun people if there's enough people, right? Yeah. 
if you have three really good people, like the couple times that I've done it with like really like just a couple other really good people, it's it's pretty satisfying even doing that. Are the are the are the bosses are they like scaled at all to the number of people that are there? No, not really. So if you're a really high end player, you got like all this awesome legendary gear. You can make a big difference. You can make a big difference. In fact, you there's people probably that could solo this. And in the past two weeks, I've gotten pretty good. Uh, I've upgraded my gear. I've got legendary effects on my really high end weapon. I can hold my own. I can easily do a third of all of the objective of this community event. So doing it with three people was was not a problem. I can easily kill ten. I can easily. I could probably do it with two people. Uh, at this point, not to toot my own horn, but uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is I got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> that that isn't how i thought you were going to end that sentence. <laughs> uh giant flying saucer appears in the sky and then a bunch of aliens beam down there's three sort of phases and there's sort of like a mini boss in between each of the phases you kill you kill them all and then you've done the event it's very very good for uh experience so again in two weeks i'm now a level 164 <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> so, which is not normal, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the kind of thing that you know. <laughs> not maybe <normal>. don't say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not normal. But you can get now. You can get like a level in just just doing this event, and I've done the event many times because then you're also doing it because you'll get a reward at the end of the event and it's plans it's plans for uh both cosmetic items and like weapons you'll get some really cool weapons there's three possible weapon plans that you can get when you get the plan then you can go back to your workshop and you can create that weapon so there's three weapons that you can get the number one thing i wanted from the event this was my first mistake is wanting something <laughs> because you right. know me right. in rng there's 26 possible plans. I wanted one, um, the number one. I wanted a bunch of them, but the, there's number one thing I wanted to get, which was this blaster, because I was pistol build. That's what I was the whole first week and a half that I played. I've sort of like moved off of that now, so it's not as big a deal. But there's this alien blaster pistol that was one of the best blasters in the game. So it it mattered. I wanted it. Uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it the first few times. It's one in 26 chance of, of getting, because there's 26 possible plans. I didn't get it about the first 10 times. Then I looked at what plans that I had gotten, and I started the spreadsheet. <laughs> As one does. How many times? You probably saw it in the notes. Let me bring up the image. How many times do you think it... So you out there, chat room. So put some numbers in the feed. How many times do you think it took me to get that plan? So one in 26 chance. Alien invasion, ma ma you know, Max's RNG. You think of SWOTOR nightlife event trying to get the Rodian. How many times do you think it took before the blaster plan dropped for me? Guaranteed plan at the end of, of every time. So I see 200. No, I didn't do the event 200 times. It's only once per hour. <laughs> it only comes up once per hour. I did it. <laughs> 37, 3, <laughs> 94. The answer is 94. I did the event 94 times. After after about 80 times, I was near rage quit. I had gotten every single other plan, most of them twice. Some of them up to five, six, seven times by 80, 80 times through the event. This is this is in a week and a half, once per hour. I was setting alarm clocks. I was I'd like go mow the lawn, then you know it'd be top of the hour, log back in for, you know, it only takes about six minutes to run the event run the event, go run, go work out, go to the grocery store, go clean the house, do some, do some side work, I'm doing, doing work, do a project morning till night, once an hour, I'm in the event. I did it about after 80 times, I started to whine and complain quite a bit. So then I got in discord was whining and complaining and ET shrimp who we've talked to in the past. He's like, I got, I, I got a plan. Just, just log in, come to, come to my base. And we, he, he gave me the alien blaster plan. I kept, I kept running it because it was, it was good for, uh, and then I, I traded a couple plans that he didn't have to, because I, I've here, I'll show you my, my spreadsheet image. I've done it 96 times total 
still. <laughs> uh, at the 94th time, the that particular plan finally dropped for me. As you can see, I had like each of the other weapons, I've got half a dozen of each of them. This one, the alien blaster has only dropped once for me in 96 times. Now I'll save all these plans because you can sell them. But that that was that was fun. Got me up to level 164. Um, got me into legendary crafting in the game. It got me all my perks. I've gotten legendary perks that have been upgraded. One level 150 is a really big threshold in sort of advancement in the game. And I have gotten deep into the game and really like what I've gotten into end game at this point. Um, so it's been, I fun. mean, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, when we talk about archeology. span Yeah. Yeah. Cause this is again, so we should, we, this is what, what we'll get into. Uh, and in fact, why don't I be done? You talk about archeology span and then we'll close with how RNG should work and shouldn't work in video games. <laughs> So I but I do want to comment on this first, and and I have played a number of games where they have hourly, some things that happen hourly, and I kind of like that, and I kind of, it, it it does feel kind of constricting too. It's almost better to have the ones that are daily, like a boss fight that's daily. Yeah. But but I I wouldn't say no to an hourly event. Let's put it that way, because I'm also event driven. Every once in a while, I know a. a something happens like this where you, I need to alarm clock it yeah. and I can only put up with it for like a week, maybe, maybe a little bit longer. Did your alarm clock it through the night also? No, no. So it was just, it was just morning. <laughs> morning I was not like waking up once an hour. You're lightweight then. <laughs> like, like again. <laughs> I have, I have done like, you know, 3 a.m. alarm clock for, that's for like a one-time things like. Yes. For like one-time an thing that had long cool down or like something. an eve invasion and the the you know a, a some a big battle is happening because or something that's been brewing for 36 right. hours yeah uh but i'll do that like once a year <laughs> this i was doing morning till night alarm clocking it uh and i i I'll, i can get into it for a little while and and have fun with yeah. it but. especially something like this where you log in and it's a few minutes of your time and it's kind of fun right like, right. why not do it? And it's very rewarding. If Even if I wasn't getting the alien blaster, that's why I was willing to put up with it because you yes, still get a reward. Too. And I was yeah. getting so many levels, which was right. getting me to 150, which I really wanted to get to because that got me really deep into the end game that I was pretty happy with being able to see. So how about, who, who tell me you, about archaeology. Who are you in the hot tub with there? What's that? that this is somebody <laughs> else's video. The... <laughs> this is not my hot tub. Okay, so archaeology is... It's not really an event, it's a profession, but it also has like a really, really punishing RNG for a few items. Yes, I've done it. But this it has made me the rage additional... quit wow back in the day. So tell me <laughs> it the has story. the additional layer though of like so you're logging in every hour, you can actually do the fight, right? So like with archaeology, if the dig site that that rare thing drops in doesn't spawn, instead it spawns other dig sites and the one you need never spawns, you can't even try a hundred times. I would love to be able to try your 96 times. Right, right, yeah. So that's kind of gotten me sort of off the loop, really. <laughs> I mean, I have been actually, I decided I would try with a different character, which is makes no sense at all, but <laughs> it's just more fun for me. But also on top of all this, there is no benefit. There's no benefit to archeology span because I'm doing it on a max level character Right. So you're not There's getting no like the experience or, there or is, some other there is, thing. There is gold. There is some, some, some oh, cash okay. to be made, um, but nothing, not a lot more or any, as much as doing other activities. So it, it doesn't. So, so what I, what I was trying to do is get a particular thing out of archeology. span Like what? you were trying to get the alien blaster. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a staff. Okay. Caster staff. And it's kind of funny because there's a ton of people in WoW uh, Classic right now running around doing archaeology. So and they're all looking for one or two of the rare items. There's a there's a sword and there's a staff and there's a trinket. I mean, there's a maybe one other thing that I don't have on my radar because it's it's melee or whatever. But <laughs> it's been kind of funny as people say in 
general like you know like hi all you weapon hunters <laughs> yeah because that's they know why that's why we're archaeologing because the the original idea was to just you know before cataclysm actually drops this is an opportunity to get your archaeology up to 450 which is the max right now so that you're ready to start it you know leveling at cata level when cata does drop so that's kind of my innocent naive look at it but as i did it and i got to 450 and i found out there's a possibility of this staff dropping if i just keep going i've done it for hours and hours and hours since then with little to no reward yeah. so i'm have you rage still... quit yet because i did i i i did this back in the day and i did weeks I did weeks. You ever rage quit but keep doing it? Um, well, that, <laughs> like a, that's, like that's like not my what brain. I don't think I'm that means brain what dead. Me. My brain quit, but my but I still love. No, in you're it. still in it. Then you haven't yeah. you haven't rage quit. Oh, what I did was I rage quit on my druid, and now I'm doing it on my no mage, which is a really bad idea because my mage now has to level archaeology back up to 450 but at least you're getting the dopamine hit of yes the, i know the it's more fun hit, because now i yes because now i'm skilling up right yeah so i could see uh, the allure of switching to uh, at least a character that then it's leveling it right right I, and she has nothing but dwar dwarven dot dig sites available and i had to actually go to another continent because I'm trying not to do the Dwarven ones because I'm trying to save it until she gets to max skill level. Yeah. Because until you get to max skill level, this staff doesn't have a possibility of dropping. Right. And I want to get the staff. The one good thing is that if you get one of these epics, they are bind on account until you, you so you can send them to your other Got it. Others. It's not like Star Wars Yellow Republic where you can all use it. It's right. like the first person who uses it, then it's bound to them. Yeah. But at least you can send it to your other character. Like I got an epic shield on my druid. So if I had a shield using character, I could send it to that character. So at least they don't make you, you know, get a worthless epic. Right. In Although they, yeah. It, and it's possible to get doubles too, which will, I mean, like in your case of the alien blasters, definitely. Like I've I've seen people accounts from people who were going for this staff right. that have like six of the sword. Right. I did this. So this isn't classic. I did this back in the day when it originally came out. There was a few things that I wanted, and I got most of everything that I wanted. I had this. I think you get the cool uh, skeleton raptor mount and right yeah. around on that. I, I like got that. that already, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I wanted, the one thing that may actually did make me take a break from from WoW because I did it for weeks and weeks and weeks was the Vial of the Sands. Yeah. So Vial of the Sands was not only a rare; it was it was a double it was double rare drop. First, you have to get the rare drop of finding a Canoptic Jar. Right. And then it's a rare chance when you open the Canoptic Jar of getting the Vial of the Sands. Right. right. Uh, and so it's like a a chance of a chance. Of, of getting it. And I grind, and grind, grind hours and hours over multiple weeks. People who don't play WoW might not know this, but like we're talking about dig sites. When you have to go from dig site to dig site, that's like could be five, 10, 15 minutes of travel in between. Right. So it's like not. It's not just like running around in a circle killing mobs. Yeah. And then the yeah. mini game to find, you know, to dig up the dig site is not trivial. You know, you got to, you got to do the, beacon and little do yeah. a little mini game I mean, to, that to, part to you kind of get up. like a second sense for but yeah but you still got to do it it's not like you just get to the dig site and check it and then you get to the dig site it's not like a one second right thing. you still have to right because you can yeah you can still luck out and do it in one dig or you can or it can take you eight digs yeah. to to get one token yeah so that did that was that was one of the grinds that had me take a break from the game the other yeah the yeah. sword is what I'm talking about, Zinrock Destroyer. So then Staff of the Sorcerer Thane Thurisin yeah. is the staff I'm after. Staff of the Sorcerer Thane Thurisin. The pieces and... of the staff still crackle with energy, and it also appears <laughs> to have suffered extensive damage. I looked up this staff on Wowhead, and the first comment was um, this guy, and he just said, I accidentally Ragnaros 
<laughs> and it turns out the story thought the of the staff or the guy is that he tried to summon is a dwarf who tried to summon Ragnaros to get an advantage in some dwarven war he was doing, <laughs> and instead <laughs> Ragnaros came and and uh, made the fire you know the mountain just made the blasted lands, which is in zone <laughs> north north of Red Ridge Red Ridge. Red Ridge, yeah. So it was sort of like, <laughs> I just thought that was so funny. <laughs> I accidentally Ragnaros. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Then, and that's a comment probably from like 2011. So just to, to wrap up this for all the game devs out there that are listening to us, bad luck protection. Build that into the game. Either, I, I, I am a proponent of variable reward schedules. So it's RNG is a thing that does drive player behavior and is a fun thing. You don't want everything to be mechanical. You don't want to, well, you have to kill 23 boards and you, then you get the thing. And there's no, no more, no less. That is just the way the thing works. However, bad luck protection, which some game devs and some game systems have built into them now, Bad luck protection should be a thing. You shouldn't have someone who's just got the amazing bad luck when it's a one in 10 drop and they've killed, you know, 400 boars and still, which, you know, this is the way odds work. Uh, that, that's possible that put, put some bad luck protection in so that if, if somebody grinds for weeks and weeks to get the staff, give them the staff. Otherwise, they're going to quit. Because if it never happens, then the variable reward schedule breaks and the player breaks and they leave the game. Right, Seema? Um, yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, I did leave WoW for a while and I regret it. <laughs> well, because when I did that, I missed the 10 year anniversary. Well, yeah, so did I. So I can never get a molten corgi now. I well, but and there was also the thing that it, like if you were subscribed for ten years, they like gave you something special physical in the mail. Yeah, and I'm I missed that too. But you know, I I I I there were many months where I didn't drop my subscription just out of laziness or unawareness. And then I finally said, Oh, I should, I'm not playing well right now. I should be paying for this. I dropped right. it. Then the 10 year anniversary happened. Yes. And then I decided to play again. It was just very unfortunate. I regret right. it. Same, same. So that's why I hesitated. Yeah. Yes. Maybe a reasonable person would rage quit. Apparently I just keep on. Yeah, playing. Just keep on keeping on. Yeah. Speaking of other games that I just can't quit. I have also still been, Coffee and contemplation logging into Arc once a day. I've given myself so Arc doesn't really have the same kind of battle pass. Babies. They don't have the event driven system really in Arc, do they? There are events that come up though. They're sort of like yeah, seasonal holiday, the holiday events. ones. Yeah. Right. But I have my own sort of objective, and it's something you can only do once a day, which is I'm trying to get some mutations on my cool wyverns. I've got a fleet of wyverns. I've got 12 of them set up and once a day they lay eggs and I can check those for the mutations. I've got plus four to, and it's, it's plus six will be the next one. I've got plus four to melee. I have a health and a stamina mutation as well that I could be working on, but I'm working on melee right now. It's only takes five minutes. I can jump, jump in there. I can check out my wyverns. I can go collect the eggs that, that, that are all around. They're very cool lightning wyverns. And if I do get them up to maybe say plus 10, uh, I can then take my fleet of wyverns and go kill the manticore. I could probably do it even sooner. I could probably do it now, but I, if I, if I'm up to like plus 10 or more melee and I get, I need a little bit higher health, I could go kill the alpha manticore which would be sort of like the big end game achievement of this particular map in arc. So I'm, I'm happy to just once a day, go log in and go check the eggs and they're cool. My little base is cool. It's not as elaborate as my base on the first map. And I, I like it as not elaborate. And it's actually gotten me to the point where I'm making less elaborate bases. Like in fallout 76, I've made two bases now in fallout 76 because you can swap back and forth between two. Uh, I like them being slightly less elaborate and then making more of them uh, because the 
the gr grind for a bunch of resources to make a big elaborate base is really fun, but very, very time consuming in most of the games. So that's another one where I've sort of, sort of made my own daily and uh, still having fun. It's a little bit more in maintenance mode right now for Ark. When the next kind of event comes out or the next map opens up, we'll probably be back in there hardcore. But until then, I'll be doing a little bit of dailies and just just touching dailies in Star Wars, uh, Fallout 76, and Ark, my personal daily, and more likely playing a little bit harder in V Rising for the next week and Starfield the week after that. Yeah. Yes, this version, if you're watching the video, this version of Fallout 76, or of Ark, the Scorched Earth map, definitely has sort of like that desert Arizona Western feel to the map. And then they added a special extra sort of cosmetics and uh, effects pack called Bob's Tall Tales. And it is, it's Western themed, Western town, Old West themed building materials and signs. It looks amazing. And effects and these wagons, covered wagons and the train it's something you would only use in PvE and really only on a server where you've modded it to have like no cost to creating things because each segment of track, <laughs> which is like one train length long, each segment of track is an amazing amount of resources that you have to grind to, to get the track. So you would never do it for anything practical. Oh no, we would never do anything like that. But if, if you've got like, if you s set the server to creative mode, we have like unlimited crafting for free you could like you can make this cool train and tracks that go around the whole zone and uh, a lot of fun stuff like that and it's very old west and chaps they have chaps you can wear um they are of course assless because as we've specified <laughs> in, in previous shows all chaps are assless <laughs> that's the way they work yeah <laughs> so there's that one uh you talked about wow and swoto or anything else you've been playing Oh, yeah. I've still been playing a little bit of Grounded. Oh, yeah. How's that going? But I How haven't gotten to the point where um, I'm able to make, like, highways across the yard or anything like that. <laughs> zip, well, zip lines. You will be able to do that a little bit. No, I know. Well, I, I yeah, I, I, saw, I saw a thing where a guy had built, like, highways. I like that better than the zip line idea, mm. but I think. I don't know. But, yeah, no. But we talked about that last week. Yeah. And that is Well, what do you think? You yeah. think you're going to push on through and sort of discover That's my that's my plan, but but archaeology kind of derailed me yeah. this week. In Biggin, I guess that's the final objective. This the final objective of the story is you trying to get home, which would mean you need to embiggen yourself. Yeah. That's what you're going for and And then the only other thing I've been playing is just for about an hour this morning, as I mentioned, V Rising, which we'll talk about more next week, but it's the I'm wondering if I'll be able to use a controller and get into it. And I should do it right now, just at the very start. Um, I'm gonna be out of town this weekend and I've installed this on my Steam Deck. So if I can get used to playing it on the Steam Deck, it feels like a game that should work really well on a controller because it's sort of like almost kind of top down. And there's limited abilities. You get to really mix and match and set your abilities. But it's more of an action combat and running around. I think doing things like building your castle, the building parts of it might still be easier with mouse and keyboard. But the action combat, running around the world, do even doing like gathering and things like that, I think would, might be something that should work well with a controller. I'm just bad at controller. But if I can... If I can get it going on the Steam Deck, I'll I'll let everyone know. It's marked as uh, works on Steam Deck, uh, but not uh, it's like not it's not their hundred percent rating. It's not certified. It's not certified hundred percent, but it's certified playable on Steam Deck. Oh, so, I see. Okay. So we'll we'll see, um, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I I don't know. It's a fun little game, Sima. I know you gotta like, you know attack innocent townspeople and suck their blood, but you know, <laughs> maybe they were bad. <laughs> you can only do it to bad people. And also you could just limit yourself to animals uh, <laughs> and not do any people if you really wanted. But look at it. Look at the beautiful 
graphics in the castle that you build. And now you can do like these multi-floor castles and it's really, it's really cool. It's really, I, I really yeah. like the art style that, that they've done. Yeah, I do too. I do. I do like the look. And an art style alone and the, the look and feel wouldn't be enough. This studio Stunlock is really good at just the, the action combat. I think it's one of the best, both how, how the abilities feel, the mix and match of all of the different abilities. They've done mm-hmm. a really good job with that. That's some part of their pedigree. Um, so we'll talk about that next week a little bit too. And then the boss system is the other thing that really drives you in, in kind of, kind of event driven way. Um, that's really cool too. So yeah, look forward to more on V Rising next week. Jump into the Discord because, as I said, I will be in there for the next week or so. But I will be out of town um, uh, Friday night and Saturday night. My daughter's graduating college, uh, so sweet. Uh, Iowa will be out at Iowa. She has done a great job. She's pretty amazing. So that's going to be fun. And we're doing a couple fun nights, some fun dinners, and the two older siblings are coming in town. So we'll all be having fun and hanging out. All right. I think, I think that is it for today. I think we've done a a good job of catching up on what we've been playing. So Mm -hmm. all the feed and subscribe links for everything that we're doing are on newoverlords.com and our video is up on YouTube slash new overlords. Please come chat with us in our discord at newoverlords.com slash discord. You can also follow on all the social networks and we'll keep you up to date in all those places too. And with that, with that, we will talk to you soon. Later, everyone.